Bloomberg Surveillance with Ken Pruitt and Tom Keen. On demand via our Bloomberg Radio Plus app. Free for iPhone and Android devices. Clark Winter is an internationally known investor and strategist. You have worked at so many places, I can I can barely list them. J.P. Morgan, Goldman Sachs, uh, Citigroup. Now you run your own group, uh, Clark Winter Enterprises. Uh, I have to ask, uh, who has the best snacks on Wall Street since you've worked at all these different places? You do, right here, out in front. <laughs> I've seen nothing like that. Well, I didn't mean on. to self-promote here, but all right. What is happening with, uh, well, I guess you start with gold. Gold seems to be at the center of everything. Is it driving a lot of things at the moment? You know, I think the best way to understand gold is to understand it's the quintessential non-dollar. People used to hold all of their fixed income, cash, and equities in dollar equivalents, and of late, there have been other ways to hold it. Euro, of course, petroleum, and gold. And gold is the most liquid, widely held by the number of people in the Middle East, Asia, India. Everybody keeps all their savings in gold. So what we basically have is an idea now that people feel it's better to put money back to work. Cash is boring, bonds are dangerous, equities don't look all that evil, and people are saying, I'm time to go back to work. Plus the sign out of Japan the other day that endless easing means that the rest of the Western world, and I would put Japan in the Western world as an economy, are going to see deflation and very low interest rates for a long time to come. So are we seeing, well, I mean, obviously you can point to equities, although not today as uh, something that would be benefiting from this change, but we're seeing a lot of money going into bonds at the moment. And... Uh, you know, where, where's the money going that's coming out of oil and other commodities? Well, the real anomaly, if you look back since 82, when interest rates started to come down, is that between cash, bonds, and equities, the best place to put your money was in bonds. In other words, you made more money for not working than you did for actually working. You made more money for just parking your money and letting interest rates return, the era of financial leverage. That's over. So the real irony, I think, is now we're entering an area where it can be rewarded for going back to work in all of its manifestations. Savers won't get a decent return. Bondholders won't get a decent return. And work in all the areas that we apply sort of the great American story are going to be rewarded, particularly when you bring pronounced productivity gains to businesses that were profitable but dysfunctional because they were able to finance their liabilities. Yeah, but, but, but you can't make any money in bonds these days, can you? You can't. And therefore, I think more and more people are switching their money out of bonds into other fixed income equivalents. When interest rates rose in the 70s, it was floating right now. So now we're going to see yeah, syndicated but- bank paper and things like that. So the big irony is you're going to be rewarded for actually being productive and going back to work as opposed to being clever. A fixed income equivalence, that doesn't include equities, does it? No. It would include MLPs. It would include bank loan syndicates. It could all kinds of things that produce a yield without the duration ricks okay. of a fixed income instrument. Then here's the money question, folks. And this is not like we're going to make money in 30 days. I'm thinking 15 years. Do we need to see U.S. companies become more European-like and distribute a larger dividend so they're more MLP-like? I think we're seeing that across a lot of publicly listed companies. And certainly if you look at privately held family-owned enterprises, they've not held back. They've been taking advantage of the ability to refinance their liabilities. They've got cheap long-term money. They're buying up their competition. They're quite optimistic about the future. The hiccup comes from that great... Uh, what shall I call it, handicap called benchmarking, when you have to compare yeah. yourself to your neighbors every day. I, I, boy, do I agree with that. Clark, I tried to memorize it. Yeah, wouldn't that be fun if we could actually get that right? But that was a seminal moment because that's also the year that money managers were able to leave banks and form their own independent asset managers yeah. and manage money. And it really was the first start of the asset management business. It's right where I wanted to go because if you look at your bio, Clark Winner, it's family office, it's serious money, it's adults sitting around a table. Has ERISA been successful? Is a defined contribution experiment been successful? Or do we need companies to tell us what to do with our retirement assets? Very important question because I've just been in Europe where everything's DB. Yes. And everybody who oh, has stop. a pension. We're did. jargon free. Rich Truman, Tane Clark winner, DB, defined <laughs> benefit. Defined right? benefit. And where there are an awful lot of people who have one or two or three pensions accumulating because they worked in various government jobs and they're blissfully ignorant. You see them walking up and down New York all these days as Europeans. How can they afford to do that? It creates a very different expectation. Those plans remain equally unfunded, except the electorate doesn't see it as their problem. I think the net effect of this in the U.S. is that people who on DC are going to go back to work when they thought they didn't have to anymore. The yeah, well, surge my, in employment will be the big, big surprise. Yeah, my rephrase of that, and correct me if I'm wrong, Michael, I think this is key for you and me. We're never going to retire. Never. There's a uh, out behind Rich Truman and Ken Felly on our team, folks, there's a secret door and a secret room. It's got the Tom King casket in it, Mike. Yeah. They're just going to roll me right in. The night it's bright right orange. Now. It's uh, sort of like the old uh, you know, Alan Greenspan answer that uh, John McCain gave of Breakfast at Bernie's or yeah. whatever that movie was. Um, 
What's driving the markets these days? I mean, what are we trading on? There's so many things out there. Europe is still there to an extent. We've got the folks in Washington uh, still fighting over this, that, and the other thing. Uh, have a terrorist incident. Uh, but is there anything at this point that people are trading on or are you looking at fundamentals or is it individual market by market? Well, I say, as we alluded to earlier, you were making more money for decades not working and speculating that you were being productive and earnest. And that's the big shift, whether it's the DC unfunded liability, the inability for savers to live off their accumulated lifetime savings. And so slowly we're finding that it's going to be necessary to go back to work. I mean, look at Google. Google's fascinating because it took one aspect of the economy, advertising, which was a highly dysfunctional in, in yellow pages and newspapers, and made it functional. You can now find what you want, and advertisers can find the clients that they want. How many more aspects of the economy are dysfunctional, are waiting to be made functional? Clark Not Winter, all of them. I, I gave a speech at Darden two years ago, and it was a 5% room. It was literally a bunch of pros like you with an actual assumption that was moldy. It was just something, you, you know, you just can't, you can't live off it. You can't retire off it, et cetera. We've had a bull market since 2009. Do you adjust your actuarial assumption up because of the good equity years we've had since the Lehman low? <laughs> Interesting question, because the actuarial assumption is made on the fact of what they need in order to meet their liabilities. It doesn't necessarily correspond to what they expect to return. And we're not going to see interest rates around 5% from here as an average unless they go up to 10 to match zero. So I think the actuarial assumptions are something people ought to cast aside. We were talking about erroneous Excel spreads a moment ago. That You ought to say, how do we actually figure out how and how much money we're going to make? Because the massive amount of unfunded obligations in the future, whether it be government, D.C. or elsewhere is so vast, it's almost impossible to calculate. What are you telling your clients today to put money into? Well, largely, if you look back at this period that's just ended, the more you speculated, the more you exceeded the circumference of tolerable behavior, the more money you made. If you were prudent and stayed below your benchmark, you lost clients. I'm saying now, do things you understand. You know, Why did Apple have such an incredible run? Because people who wanted to put money into equities went to something they comprehended, the product they understood, and if you didn't get it, your daughter would explain to you why Apple's so wonderful. Now we're seeing people go to other things they comprehend. So if you look at high net worth or investors around the world, they're doing things they say, I get it, I can sleep with it, I understand it, I don't worry about the vol. Right. I remember going to Hong Kong a few years ago and finding the locals very happily trading Hong Kong real estate stocks. Immensely volatile, but they said, there's the rock. I see it. I know what I own. I don't right. care about day-to-day -day price. 15 so, seconds. Do I buy Apple here? Apple has been a brilliant innovator, but I think it's moved ahead of itself, and others have caught up with it. I think long-term, the company is an incredible enterprise. But short-term, the competition is paying it the ultimate compliment by innovating and doing what they do and doing it cheaper. Clark Winter, thank you um, so much. Bloomberg Surveillance, weekday mornings at 7 Eastern. In New York on Bloomberg 1130. In Boston on 1200 AM and 94.5 FM HD2. Or on Sirius and XM Satellite Radio Channel 113. Copyright 2013 Bloomberg LP.